Hi, I'm going to watch. Hi, I'm going to watch the. I'm going to watch. I'm going to make you watch. Hi, hi, hi. I'm going to talk about the first. I'm going to talk about the first ten books. Wow, I'm so out of practice. I'm so out of practice. Let's try this one more time. Hi, my name is Matthew, and today I'm going to be talking about the first ten books that I read in 2021. Nailed it. I've read ten books this year so far. And, uh, that makes me feel pretty. So, let's go. Up first is Bad Love by Ma'ame Blue, which is a book that I purchased in 2020, meant to get to in 2020, but, uh, didn't. So, I read it. I loved it. I thought it was so fun, so entertaining. Bad Love is, as its title suggests, about a bad love. A bad, tumultuous, mercurial relationship, and you as a reader get to dive into all of its faults and failings. And I enjoyed picking it apart. I enjoyed going through the ride of this particular couple. But more so than that, I enjoyed the characters on the periphery, and something that I think that this book does successfully is building its world, where despite whatever is happening to the main characters and the central relationship at hand, there is always something else going on outside that will impact it, and vice versa. I feel like a lot of tumultuous love stories end up becoming too insular, and there is something interesting psychologically to explore with regard to that, but I kind of liked that this was a little bit more broad, that this was a little bit more nebulous. No, not the right word. I liked that this was a little bit more expansive, and I found myself growing attached to other characters as well, as the central relationship. So I would recommend this book if you are interested in contemporary fiction, Your Luster by Raven Lalani, Your Normal People by Sally Rooney, the very digestible, exciting to read, fun and debatable texts that are out there currently. This book is very on trend with those. Up next I read Must I Go by Yi Yun Lee. If you have read any Yi Yun Lee book ever before, I don't think that this book is going to be different. I still enjoyed it. But in many ways, it felt like kind of reading Yi Yun Lee's greatest hits. I think about this with regard to authors like Haruki Murakami or Ali Smith, authors who have such significant, prominent, individualized styles, and don't often stray from those styles. And there is something that is pleasurable about sitting down and reading a book from those authors, because you know what you're going to get. You can kind of brace yourself for impact, and you can enjoy it because you have seen it be successful in the past. Yi Yun Lee, to me, is one of those authors, and while I do think that Yi Yun Lee has experimented in style and form, she also writes in uh, nonfiction and short stories as well, I just think that thematically this book doesn't necessarily tackle anything that her other books don't. It's about grief, mortality, suicide, aging, memory whose life deserves to be remembered. Things like that, things that Yi e. Lee likes to talk about in her books. I feel like most people would DNF this book because it is super slow and densely written, but I would encourage you to stick with it and or just pick up something else by Yi e. Lee. Um, I really liked Where Reasons End. That's my favorite book that she has written, and I think it's just a little bit snappier, a little bit punchier, and that might be a better place to start than this one. Up next is The Secret Life of Church Ladies by Disha Filia, which needs no introduction. This is a very popular book, especially if you are on Bookstagram, but I have seen a lot of coverage for it on Booktube as well in light of the National Book Award long listing. This is a collection of nine short stories, all analyzing the secret lives of church ladies, the deviant lives, the very individualized relationships with faith, religion, church that a bunch of different women have. And I really loved it. I thought it was so well written. I wanted each story to be its own novel. And in many ways, each story already was its own novel. This was a short story collection that utilized short stories to their fullest extent. And without the cheap gimmicks and tricks that I often find short story collections have. This book didn't need any fuss or flair or flamboyance. It was simply and confidently itself. And I walked away stunned by how good it was. Um, so totally worth the hype if you are looking for just good fiction. If you're looking for good fiction, pick up this book. 
It's so good. Up next, I read Your Story, My Story by Connie Palman. This is translated by Eileen J. Stephen and Anna Asbury. This is a book that tells the story of the relationship and marriage of Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath, specifically from Ted's perspective. And this book was a firecracker. It was so rich and luxurious. It Luxurious. It had such a decadent sensibility about it, a sensual sensibility about it, all the while exploring very toxic depictions of what romance is. Um, this book does not take a healthy psychological standpoint. It's not supposed to, uh, mind you, um, but it's one that just begs empathy and sympathy for what is so unhealthy, so psychologically painful, so wrong, so not okay um, for two people to treat each other like that. Um, so I, I liked how evocative and how thrilling the text itself was, luring you as a reader almost into agreeing with this perspective. The writing is absolutely incredible. I had to stop and remind myself that this book was in translation, and it makes me really curious as to what the original text reads like, because this one was so just delicious. It's not a good descriptor for language, but it just was. It felt good to read. It felt satisfying. I was satiated by the language in this book. And though it talked about tumultuous, uh, bad things, I went along for the ride and loved it. I thought its its, its text was brilliant. Up next, I read Prefecture D by Hideo Yokoyama. This is translated by Jonathan Lloyd Davies. I am a huge Hideo Yokoyama fan. This book solidified that for me. I loved 6-4, I loved 17. Prefecture D is no different. Prefecture D is four novellas that take place in the world of 6-4, and I thought it was really well executed. I really like spending more time with some of these characters in this particular atmosphere, with this particular writing. I think that the thing that makes Hideo Yokoyama so exciting as an author is that he's not necessarily concerned with catching culprits or plot twists or, you know, these thrilling mysteries. He's more concerned about the people involved in them and watching them sweat. Each story that he has written that I have read is just a pressure cooker, and you watch these people trying to solve crimes, and you want to know whether or not they will break before they can. And that's just a different genre than I feel like other people are operating with. It's not a, quite a thriller, it's not quite a, a, a drama. If I had to categorize it, I would say psychological drama, because you are concerned with the psychology of people in a dramatic situation, sure, but unfortunately it has to be like marketed as a thriller, because there's no other shelf to shelve it on. Um, so if you see it and think that it's going to be a thriller, it's not. It's going to be something different, and that different thing is is different. It's, it's thrilling in a different way. Next was The Malevolent Volume by Justin Philip Reed, and this was one of the best poetry collections I've read in some time. This is a poetry collection that, like, hurts. Um, the language used, the imagery, the metaphors, they are meant to cause harm upon reading. This is a book that is visceral in the literal sense. It is a book that is about pain and inflicting pain and how pain can be inflicted, both emotionally and physically. There are lines and words that just made me as a reader cringe and flinch in a way that other poetry collections have not been able to make me do, That in a way that other novels have not been able to make me do. Justin Philip Reed's command over language as weapon is what makes this so good to read and so powerful to read. So I highly recommend it. Um, I would just make sure that you're in a, like a good space, a good mindset before diving in. But I think that it is really good poetry. I think it is accessible as it is dealing with timely subject matter, as it is dealing with eternally uh, relevant subject matter, and all the while using language in a very exciting way that I have not necessarily seen other people able to use language before. Up next is Ordesa by Manuel Vilas, and this is translated by Andrea Rosenberg. And this wasn't my fave. I really wanted to like this book. It's, it's very densely philosophical. It's incredibly masculine. 
If you know anything about me, that's just not like an equation that's gonna add up to be something that is successful for me. I liked the deep dive into this one character's mindset and their history, and especially his relationship to his parents I thought was really fascinating. Um, his relationship to aesthetics and artifice were really interesting to me, but ultimately this is a meandering text. This is one that is going to pontificate on different subject matter and not necessarily move you through a plot. Um, it's not necessarily concerned with plot, and I just either wasn't in the proper headspace to read it at the time, or perhaps the masculine energy uh, was just a little bit overwhelming and perhaps even off-putting to me. His relationship to women that he talks about, his relationship to the world, is one that I don't necessarily agree with. And when you as a reader are met with a character study, and that character study has an ideology that is so overwhelmingly different from yours, and it's just that for the book, you might not have a good time reading. And that's just what happened to me. Um, if you were interested in this book, I would still pick it up and give it a shot, because I think that the writing is gorgeous, the translation is really well done and interesting. I feel ambivalent about this text. There were parts of it that I really enjoyed, there were parts of it that I found completely off-putting, and combined uh, that to give it like a 2.5 stars. Next I read God I Feel Modern Tonight Poems from a Gal About Town by Kat Cohen. This is a book coming out February 2nd. I got it from work, so I am biased in what I am about to say about this book. However, I really enjoyed this book. Um, <laughs> I think it is such fun poetry. It is such contemporary poetry. It is so minimalist, it is so fluid, it is not concerned with the form and structure of poetry so much as the feeling and expression of poetry, and I find that to just be very on trend for poetry right now. Um, it is very hashtag relatable, it is very millennial, it is very depressing in the most comically dark way. It is all about sex and depression and fixation and life in New York City and drugs and booze and it is so relatable, um, painfully. Um, and I think that Kat Cohen, Catherine Cohen, as she is credited on the book, is somebody who I'm very curious to see where she will go next, if she will go next, you know? I think this is an interesting poetry collection to take a chance on, I'm excited about it, and I think that there is a lot of potential uh, captured in a lot of the poems, because it's not just surface-level funny things. There is, underneath the irreverence, underneath, you know, the, the pageantry, there is this earnest undercurrent of distress. There is this truly captured unrest that I think she is able to achieve with her writing. And if it were not for that, I'd probably be like, oh, this is fun, moving on. But because of that, I am far more invested in her as a poet and her utilizing this form to tell the things that she needs to tell. So, um, a lot of fun. Keep an eye out for it. It, 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 it. Read it in a flash. It is so fast to read. You can pick it up, read it, laugh, put it down. You can read it in one sitting. It's poetry that is meant to be consumed in a very fleeting and fresh and fun way. Second to last is Likes by Sarah Shun Yen Bynum, and this is a short story collection. Okay, I need, to, I need to just put it out there. Of course, like, I make a video, and I mention in the video that, like, I don't like short story collections. I think all short story collections are not for me. Plot twist, I read, like, six short story collections in a row that I love. Like, all of them. I just really enjoy. Um, <laughs> so egg on my face, you know. Anyway, Likes is an immaculate short story collection. It is so purely and cleanly written. There is such wisdom in the subtle simplicity of the writing. I describe this book as a menagerie of complex lives. Each story is its own just beautiful world with very, very human people, and the text always meets them at eye level to scrutinize. Like, yes, Scrutiny does ensue. There is a quippiness to a lot of the writing moments, but it is not without empathy and it is not without care. And I think that that balance is what makes this short story collection so special. These are slice of life stories. They are hefty slices of life. It's like taking a big slice of like a rich cheesecake. It's still a small piece, but it's just so full and will leave you satisfied. Metaphors. This is why I'm not an author. But yeah, I was just really impressed with this collection. I'm kind of bummed that it took me so long to get to it because I purchased it a while back, and I I will 
look forward to reading other books from this author going forward. Lastly, I read a poetry collection, Flesh by Mary Jean Chan. This was a reread. This reread, unfortunately, I didn't care for this poetry collection as much as I did the first time I read it. I think because I was familiar with its innovations, it was less exciting for me. That being said, objectively, it's so strong and I would encourage people to pick it up. My favorite poem in the collection happens on page 19. It's called Conversation with Fantasy Mother, and I thought I would read it for you because this was the poem that really hooked me for this book, and it might hook you into wanting to read it. Um, I don't read poetry on this channel. This will be my first time doing so. That's embarrassing. Okay. Dear Fantasy Mother, thank you for taking my coming out as calmly as a pond accepts a stone flung into its depths. You sieved my tears, added an egg, then baked a beautiful cake. You said, let us celebrate, for today you are reborn as my beloved. The candles gleamed and the icing was almost true, impossibly white, coated with the sweetness of sprinkles. We sat together at the table and ate. Afterwards, I returned to my room and touched all the forbidden parts of myself, felt a kindness I had not known in years. I, I don't have much to say about that poem. Um, I just really liked it and I think that it is lovely. So if you also thought that that was lovely, then pick up this poetry collection. So those are 10 books that I have read at the start of 2021. Those are the first 10 books that I've read this year. Unfortunately, I have yet to read like a good five-star book and I look forward to being able to. I think that I've read some amazing books so far, some really, really close to five-star books so far, but I want that book-tingly sensation of discovering something that I particularly love, and I have yet to get that. And there's plenty of time left in the year. So if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, opinions, or beliefs about anything that I've talked about today, put those below. If you have read any of these books, if you have liked any of these books, let me know. What was the first book that you read in 2021? That's exciting. Answer that question for me. I love being nosy. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you soon.